I want to hear cannons. Outfield, pull up, ball to the five, touchdown Tampa Bay. My heavens, does it again. Fire the cannons, Bucks. It's first and goal. That's picked off. That's picked off. And who else? Rondé Barber. And the Tampa Bay Buccaneers may ride to the Super Bowl with that one. Third down, 18. Dropping Gannon, looking Gannon, looking Gannon. Those up with the head. Hands intercepted. Derrick Brooks, 30. Brooks to the 29. He's 20. Derrick Brooks all the way. There it is. The dagger's in. We're going to win the Super Bowl. Brooks to the 30. And there are the cannons go. Fire them. Cannons. Keep on firing. 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 My good buddy and co-host from BucksNation.com, Mr. Evan Wanish. Today, we have got a very special episode for you. Not only have the Tampa Bay Buccaneers players started to report back to Advent Health Training Center for the offseason program, but we are getting ready to dive into all things NFL Draft because we are less than two weeks away, Evan, and I know that this is like Christmas for you every single year, so uh, excited to see what's on tap for today. Yeah, it's honestly, it's kind of crept up. Um, yeah, hard to believe that we are very, very close to the NFL draft. And uh, typically it's like I'm trying to pull teeth, trying to freaking wait for this thing, wait for this thing. And here it's, you know, like I said, it kind of crept up on us. So, uh, yeah, very excited. And, uh, yeah, most of today's show is going to be uh, going to be about the draft. Obviously, the Buccaneers are back in the building. Um, not every single player. And, like, let me just remind everybody that, doesn't really matter um, that, you know, if some players aren't at uh, voluntary workouts. So, um, but it is nice to see, you know, actual football, you know, uh, guys being back in the building. So even if it is basically just you're working out just with, with your team instead of at, you know, your local gym. But, um, but the draft is here. Uh, it is obviously a very exciting time. The Bucks, honestly, it's a pretty important draft for them. I mean, it really is that you talk about, uh, building off of what they did last year. And we talk about the rookie class that they had last year with Kalaja Kansi, uh, Yaya Diaby, both being, you know, great contributors. Uh, Cody Malk, you know, sort of coming on towards the end of the season there. Uh, you know, you talk about those guys and it just, it sort of highlights the importance, right, of the draft. Where would this Bucks team have been? Yaya Diaby led the team with seven and a half sacks. He led the team. So where would they have been without Yaya Diaby? Where would they have been without Kalaja Kansi? You know, would they have had even more question marks at the right guard position without Cody Malk? So I do think any, I mean, even, you know, Trey Palmer, like he had to play an even bigger role because of Russell Gage's injury. So he had to become the wide receiver three. So really their draft class last year was really good. I think it's important for them. And like, I understand no GM is going to hit a thousand. Like it's, it is what it is, but it's important, I think, especially in your first couple of picks here. You have four picks in the top 100 um, with that extra third-round selection that you got from the Carlton Davis trade. I, I think it's important to, to nail at least the, these first three, right? Uh, preferably, you nail all four of your top 100 picks. But I, I think if they want to take that next step, right, from being, okay, you won the NFC South, it was a poor division, you won a playoff game, but then, but then you lost to Detroit. If you want to take that next step, you know, to maybe winning double-digit games, winning the South a little more convincingly, maybe end up beating a team like Detroit, right, and going to the NFC Championship game, I think it's got to start. And, and look, and they've had a great offseason, right? Like, we've talked about it. Uh, we're not going to go over free agency again, but, like, we all know what they did, right? They brought back most of the people, added Jordan Whitehead, added some depth in, in some areas. But I, I think you're going to get some key contributors here from the draft, as we saw last season. And like I said, we were talking about making that next step towards being another tier of contender. I think it's got to start. I think it's got to start, uh, you know, in the first round next Thursday and then continue on. Yeah. And you talked about hitting on the guys that are, you know, outside the realm of expected superstars. You know what a first round pick is. If you have good real estate in the first round, chances are he's going to do well. You get the occasional bust. It happens every single year. But you start talking about reaching into the second and the third and the fourth rounds. Not only do you want to find guys who are going to stick around for your franchise, but potentially you could knock those uh, hits out of the or those picks out of the park if you know those guys can come in and be contributors day one. Like Cody Mount came in and was a starter day one. Uh, mm -hmm. It took Yaya Diaby and Kalijah Kansi a little bit 
further into the season to come in and really make their presence felt. But once they finally got past all the injury BS and locked themselves into the rotation, Yaya Diaby jumping JTS on the depth chart mm-hmm. and happening during the 2023 season, once they got settled in and you got rid of those, I guess you could say a rookie hiccup, you know, a, a, an awkward period, it, it, it it's different depending on the position, but for guys like Yaya Diaby and Kalijah Kansi, last year they came in along that defensive line. They were a godsend. If those guys had played like that the entire season, much more people would have been talking about giving them their 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 flowers for uh you know prospective defensive rookie of the year. But those day two picks, those day three picks that can turn into starters, uh, those are the things that take a good draft and make it a great draft at the end of the day. Yeah. And Jason Light especially these last couple of years, he's he's had some mid-round guys go out there and make it pretty big. I mean, look, at the end of the day, you got to hit on your first round pick, right? Yeah. I mean, that that's that that is a must. Um and, and and look, I mean, Jason Light has been good, but at the, at the same time, you, know, you just mentioned Joe Trinchwinka, who yeah, the obby jumped. Joe Trinchwinka, I know it was the thirty second overall pick. I know it's the last pick of the first round, but uh, it's still not great for a first round pick, right? Like you want more production out of a first round pick there. Uh, Vernon Hargraves didn't even make it through his entire tenure with the Buccaneers, uh, and he was an even higher draft pick. So uh, you need your first round picks to hit. And luckily for the Bucks, their last couple, you know, have been Tristan Wirfs and Kalaja Canty. I know we're still it's still early on Canty, but the early returns look pretty good. Um, so. I, I just think you gotta you gotta be able to hit on that first round pick. And then honestly, to that today's podcast, that's gonna be the focus mostly is you know their options in the first round and sort of you know what direction they can go here. Yeah, and another aspect that ultimately adds to the draft strategy for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, you just talked about Joe Tryon Shoinka being picked in that 2021 NFL draft. Uh 32nd overall pick in the first round. The Bucs were Super Bowl champions. The Bucs are no longer in that situation. You, you can look at what they've done in free agency, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more, and you can decide if they're in a position to take best player available. But when you are the Super Bowl champion of the world, you're literally in a position where you look at your team from last year and you're like, eh, there's a couple holes, but we can take whoever we want. Unfortunately, well, especially when you know they brought back... Right, from the that entire... team, they brought back everybody, right? <laughs> yeah. They brought back Shaq Barrett. They brought back Levante David. Yeah. Chris, yeah, they brought back everybody. So Yeah, but, you know, the Bucks obviously not being in that championship window anymore, your strategy changes. You need a little bit more from these guys that you're picking on day one and even day two when you get into, you know, rounds two and three. Those got to yeah. be big hits. Yeah, and, and those guys are also, they're going to get more opportunity you, as well. You don't want another Kyle Trask on your hands. Yes, I mean, and look... That was again. That was that same draft. That was a George Ryan Schwinga draft. Mm-hmm. You know where I, I still didn't quite understand at the time because to me, just in, in my head, right. And and the reason they did it though was because they didn't have many needs, right? Like they didn't have many glaring needs. And you were looking at it as you know the thirty second overall pick at Joe Ryan Schwinga. You're like, man, like whoever they pick at thirty two is pretty much a luxury, right? Joe Trangerwinka didn't even start in 2021 his rookie season because it was still Shaq Barrett and Jason Pierre-Paul there. And I think that was their sort of reasoning with Kyle Trask is like, look, we might be able to get a developmental quarterback um, who's going to be able to to sit for a year or two and, like, we don't really need much anyway. On the flip side, one of the reasons why I was opposed to the Trask thing was because, one, I wasn't the biggest fan of Trask coming out. And, two, felt like a win-now team, sure, you you do have that luxury, right, of maybe not having as many needs, but I felt like a win-now team needed to get somebody who could potentially help, right? If somebody goes down, I mean, hey, God forbid, you know, a guy like Chris Godwin tears his ACL late in the year and you need another receiver, uh, or... You know, Trista Worfs goes down and isn't available for a divisional playoff game. Maybe you need another tackle. But instead, you had Kyle Trask, you know, riding the bench. So, yeah, but also, like like you said, the Bucks are in a completely different position now than they were back then. Um, and I would be shocked if you see any type of, you know, selection like that, unless it's just, you know, simply too good to pass up. But Yeah, before we dive into the draft, I did want to get everyone caught up on just a couple of headlines while we are talking about the pass rush, in particular, this defensive line. Will Golston will be returning back to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for his 12th NFL season. It was announced yesterday he'll be back with the Bucs on, I believe, a one-year deal. Don't know what the 
number is on it, but it's going to be cheap. Uh, it has been cheap for Big Will the last couple of years, and that is just fine. But I wanted to pick your brain on this other guy, this new addition. Shaq Barrett leaves. The Bucks go out and seemingly find a cheaper replacement. At least this is my opinion of the move in Randy Gregory, a guy that, you know, it, it, a lot of people may agree that his best days are behind him. He's been in San Francisco behind that stack defensive line. What do you make of this? It's a uh, three million base with up to five million, and I believe Shaq Barrett's making close to seven or eight in Miami. Yeah, um, it's fine. I, I mean, I mean, you are right. I mean, he's not. And look, like he was never the player that that Shaq Barrett was. Um, so I don't really think it's fair. It, you know, people come into this season expecting Randy Gregory to have sort of the same, you know. Uh, impact that even Shaq Barrett, not even let's not even talk about 2019 yeah, Shaq no Barrett, way. but <laughs> no yeah, way. no, that's not gonna happen. But I'm gonna say, I don't know um, very many people expected over double digit sacks for Gregory next year. I mean, Randy Gregory's never had double digit sacks uh, right, in, his, yeah. in the season, so it's yeah. not gonna happen at 31 years old. Okay, I can tell you that, but. Uh, what he can be is a solid rotational veteran guy who, like, I thought I felt they needed. Like, they released Shaq Barrett, and they kind of didn't replace him at all. Now, I don't think Randy Gregory is a direct replacement to, replacement to Shaq Barrett. Like, I don't think he's coming in and be like, all right, all right you're going to play the same exact role that Barrett did. Right. Um, but I do think that it was a veteran presence that they needed. So now you're looking at their outside linebackers as, you know, Randy Gregory – Joe Trishwinka, Yaya Diaby, Anthony Nelson. That's kind of the top four right now. And that's before the draft. I I think they're going to draft an outside linebacker. It's like in the first three rounds. Like yeah. one of their first four picks in the first three rounds there is going to be a pass rusher. Uh, so I do think there's going to be somebody else added there. Um, but I mean, it, it's a fine deal. I just think, you know, sort of uh, to me at this point, Well, like it, it is weird because it's normally those guys are like the you know guys that like were good a while ago, right? Whereas like Randy Gregory's like kind of been a bit underwhelming in his NFL career. But like I said, they need a veteran, so um, and it's cheap enough at a one year deal, so I'm fine with the move. Well, let's move on. Let's get into the meat and potatoes, breaking down draft day scenarios, specifically first round scenarios, mostly for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. We'll list off some. Some of the top prospects you'll see as well on draft day, what to expect, uh, and maybe in particular what position groups to expect. We are talking about the defensive line. We are talking about the edge rushers. So, Evan, let's let's hear what you've got. I, I guess we'll open up with uh, you know some scenarios for the Bucks if they ultimately want to stay put with the 26th pick in the first round of the 2024 NFL draft. So if they stay put, uh, what's on the table here? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I think the big one is kind of a mystery on how they feel about him. But the big one is uh, uh, UCLA edge rusher uh, Laatu Latu. Um, you want to talk about talent? Uh, he might be the most talented pass rusher in this draft. However, there is, you know, significant red flags that could cause him to fall to 26. Like, that could be the reason. Um, he actually had to medically retire. Uh, from the game of football a few years ago. Uh, his injuries were that bad. He has a laundry list of injuries. Honestly, reminds me a lot of a few years ago, which coincidentally, they actually both uh, had to retire and then you know, had UCLA as part of that journey. But uh, Jalen Phillips a few years ago, um, who was drafted, I believe, 18th overall by Miami. But, you know, had he stayed healthy, you know, probably would have been maybe a top 10 pick uh, just in terms of talent. And I think Latu Latu is pretty similar. Uh, he's a really good football player, but there are risks involved. So I don't know how the Bucks feel about that, right? There's going to be some teams that just do not like the medicals, do not want to take the risk. He did play this year and he did well. Like, and he, he's been healthy. But whenever you have to medically retire from the game of football, that's a big red flag, especially when it's something as important as a first-round pick there. So uh, all the talent in the world, we'll see if he falls. He may not fall. 
Like he, he may not there. I don't expect him to be a top 15 pick, but I think, you know, there's a few teams in front of the Buccaneers that, that could definitely use him. And uh, I, I, I could see, you know, teams like the Rams potentially uh, picking him, especially, you know, with Aaron Donald being out. I know they play two different positions, but um, I could see a couple other teams. I mean, I know, you know, the, the, the Saints have an E at pass rusher, even though I think they're more likely to go tackle. Uh, but there, there is a few teams in front of the Buccaneers. Uh, Seahawks have a needed edge. Uh, so there's a few teams in front of the Bucs that could use him, and it wouldn't shock me if they picked him. But it also wouldn't shock me if he's there for the Bucs. Also wouldn't shock me if they passed. Like, I have no idea how they feel about his medicals. Like I said, there are some teams that are going to have him high on their board, and they're going to say, we feel comfortable. And there's going to be other teams that say, look, we're just we're not willing to take that chance. And I don't know where the Buccaneers fall on that. Uh, some other options at edge, particularly, uh, would be uh, Penn State's Chop Robinson. I, I feel like he is very boomer bust. Uh, this guy feels like a guy who is either going to get you, you know, every year, like three and a half, four sacks, just as like a designated pass rusher, or he's going to be able to get you consistently, not you know, in the upper echelon of 17, 18 sacks a year, but he's going to be able to get you close to double the sacks, you know, 10, 11 sacks a year. Uh, and obviously that's a very valuable piece. I think there isn't really much of an in-between with Chop Robinson and the sack production wasn't really there in college, but the pass rush win rate was, and the pressure production was there as well. So that's something where you're going to have to kind of rely on your coaching uh, yeah. and your development there with a guy like Chop Robinson, but you'd be taking a chance there too. Well, like I, I also got to think that Jason Light can look at a coach like Todd Bowles and he can hear feedback from guys who, honestly, like Jordan Whitehead, who left and came back and said publicly, Todd Bowles is a coach who knows how to get the most out of some of these guys. And I think Jordan Whitehead could be considered – not boomer bust because he was good for the Bucks for a couple of years before he got signed up there in New York, but he just didn't have the same type of success under different coaching. Uh, I think with a project like Chop Robinson, just the pure speed that he's got is is the one really exciting yeah. detail. You know, the Bucks I don't think have had that kind of speed on the edge. No. Like Joe Tryon Joink is quick, he's twitchy, but sometimes he's too fast. You know, he has a habit of running past the play. Um, and maybe that's something else that could happen with Chop Robinson. Maybe that's a legitimate concern. But I think if you are Todd Bowles and you look at just the measurables alone, you, you got to be chomping at the bits to see what you can do with that guy. If you can fine tune him and, uh, you know, really get him dialed in. Because again, legitimate threat to be a legitimate threat at edge rusher in the NFL. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he, he does have the, the potential. It's just he's got to go to the right spot and we'll see if Tampa Bay is the right spot. So, um I don't think he's at like the very top of their board. Like I, I don't, I don't think so. But I do think, excuse me, I do think he's going to be in consideration. You know, at, at twenty six. So, uh, and then another name I want to throw out. I don't think this guy's going to be there. I have seen some things, uh, like I've just read online, seen a few different mocks about you know this guy potentially being there, and I, I don't really agree with it. At the end of the day, um, but it's Florida State's uh, edge, Jared Verse who actually would have probably been a top 15 pick, maybe a top 20 pick last year, uh, they're elected to go back to school and now find themselves sort of in a similar boat, like a top, probably a top 20 pick. But there has been some thought that he could fall, you know, to the Buccaneers. And again, don't really know how he they feel about him. Sort of projects, it reminds me a lot of uh, Brandon Graham in, uh, up in, there in uh, Philadelphia with the Eagles. Um it reminds me a lot of that sort of not a guy who's going to unlike chop Robinson, not a guy who's going to beat you as much with his speed, more of a guy, yeah, the Audi mode of like going to beat you more with power. Um, but he's a good player. And I, I don't know how high the ceiling is, but I think his floor is also pretty high. So I, I think he'd be going with a pretty safe bet there. I just don't know if he's going to be there. Unlike some of those mock drafts that I've seen that have him being at 26, have the Buccaneers selecting him at 26. I just don't know if I'm sold that he's going to be available there at that spot. So um, we'll have to wait and see. But as far as edge rushers in the first round, um, those are the three that I think the Buccaneers could consider. Uh, you know, uh, there's obviously 
a couple of other guys like Chris Braswell from Alabama, probably more of a second round guy at this point. Braylon Trice, more of a second round guy. I know a Marshawn Nealand is a guy who a lot of people like on the edge. Again, more of a second round guy. So when you're looking at edge rusher, I think in the first round and a guy like Dallas Turner isn't going to be there. Uh, he, he, I actually think he's going to end up as a top 10 pick. Uh, but so I just, I just don't think Dallas Turner is going to be there. And, uh, I think if you're looking at realistic options as far as edge rusher for the bucks in round one, I, I think he'd probably come back to those three. Um, and then, you know, move on to, you know, another position where, you know, I want to get your thoughts on those three first. And, um, but then I want to move on to a position on the other side of the ball that I think they could target as well. Yeah. I like chop Robinson, especially just because I talked about the prospect of him well, you talked about the prospect of him being a boomer bust player, but I feel like Todd Bowles more so than the next coach. I know he gets his fair amount of slack every year, especially since becoming the head coach of the Bucks. But I, I just I feel like he can unlock certain guys like that. You know, the development of Kalaja Kansi, the development of Yaya Diaby. I'm hooked to see what happens with those guys this year because I think the fact that they were so pro ready last year you got to give Todd Bowles credit, especially with the injury trouble beginning of the season for Kalijah Kansi. Yaya yeah. Diaby didn't start eating up more reps until later in the season. Like, that's 100%. Their development is on Todd Bowles. So I think with a project like Chop Robinson, just a freak athlete, like, that would be fun to see what they could do out there. Uh, but we've seen athletic players come into this system and not necessarily strive. So I, I do think edge rusher is the pick that I like the most at, at 26. Uh, I think first round, you know, when you look at this defensive line, I think a couple of people in chat already brought it up. The Bucks just lost their number one corner. And other than Randy Gregory, this defensive line is kind of the same. Like it, it, <laughs> it doesn't feel much different. We just brought Will Golston back for the 12th year in a row. Doesn't feel like he's going to come in here and save this defensive line. It kind of feels like the the twelve hundredth year, <laughs> right? Um, so I I think you have to continue to address this pass rush, and uh, we're definitely on the right track with Kalijah Kansi and Yaya Diaby. But I don't think if you're the Bucks, you can head into this season happy with that defensive line, just assuming those guys are going to blossom and continue to grow. Because regardless of how good they were in their rookie year they're going to have to be better this season, especially if they're going to be starting and getting much more reps for the entire regular season. I expect those guys to make more of an impact, but you need another impact player down there. I would like to see another guy that they can develop and uh, make a staple on this defensive line for the next couple of seasons. Right. And look like they, they have invested resources there, right? They, they have, um, they drafted Joe Trichwick in the first round, twenty twenty one. They went right back to the defensive line in twenty twenty two with Logan Hall, and then they drafted the defensive line in twenty twenty three with Kalaja Kansi. They have you know spent resources there, but like I don't care if you spent resources there if they the resources haven't worked out. Like I'm out on Joe Trichwick. Like if he surprised me, he surprised me this year. I just don't see how a pass rusher in year four is all of a sudden it's going to click for him, right? Um, Logan Hall. Yes, we're going you know, going into year three, but the early returns right now are not great. Like, like it just it looks like a average to below average defensive lineman. It just doesn't really make much of an impact. Had his and, moments last year, more more moments than he did his rookie season. Had a couple. Yeah, of highlights yeah. I mean, last he, year, was playing, again, he was playing a bit more last year, yeah. but but still, it, it, like you said, just doesn't doesn't feel like it's enough. Doesn't feel like it's going to be enough to to build on at least. Right. Um. So I. Look, I I do think they need and look. Uh, I want to bring this up too. Obviously, we talk about Pew Report here a lot. We give them the, their flowers a lot. They do great work, but they did put out a mock draft. I think it might have been a week or two ago, where it was a seven round mock, and they had the Bucks selecting Tyler Guyton in the first round, who is an offensive tackle slash interior offensive line, a good player, but. They didn't have them take an edge rusher like at all in the first three rounds. And I just I can't do it. Like I just I I I can't do it. I because to me, you are just putting way too much faith. And I know we talked about you know Todd Bowles' ability to develop players and everything like that, whatever. But you're just putting way too much faith in a guy like Yaya Diaby to continue to develop seven and a half sacks is a darn good rookie year. 
Like, and it feels like you're really putting a lot of stock in him continuing to develop and taking another step. And I just don't know, like, if he has the same exact year or a year quite similar to that, like, is this pass rush going to be any better? Like, probably not. Like, it, it probably, Randy Gregory isn't going to be making much of a difference there. It's not going to be a difference between if Yadi Diaby has, let's say, seven and a half sacks again, you know, it's not going to be like Randy Gregory was the difference between the defensive line, the pass rush being underwhelming, um, you know, and, and it, you know, being good. Well, and, and I think, you know, some more context to that scenario is if Yaya Diaby finishes the season with seven or seven and a half sacks and he leads the team again, then I think we'll have a pretty good idea of how the pieces around Kansi and yeah. Yaya Diaby, you know, it, what his supporting cast looked like. Because last year, again, we talk about one hell of a rookie season, but seven and a half sacks led the team. And like that, that's concerning. It shouldn't be like that. <laughs> Especially from a rookie of all people, and and they did, and a lot of people bring up, well, they had a lot of sacks as a team, and they did, but why did they struggle against really? Why did they struggle? Why did Jared Goff consistently tear them up? Right, all, all, all year long. Why did they struggle to get to the quarterback without running any blitzes? You know, well, it, yeah, we, well, we, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, and why they struggled to when when they faced good quarterbacks? What happened? You know, like like C.J. Stroud, Josh Allen. Like, I understand I'm naming very, very good quarterbacks. I'm not naming slouches here. But look at some of the quarterbacks you got on your schedule. Uh, you play Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, Justin Herbert. I mean, you know, Kirk Cousins now. Like, sure, like, he, he's not like he, he's not he's not those type of levels, but he's better than Desmond Ritter. You know, like, like he he's better than what Atlanta had last year. You know, Derek Carr shredded them Did in the game that the Bucs could have won the division because the Bucs couldn't get a pass rush. And the Saints offensive line was terrible last year. So if the Bucs, again, we talk about why I opened up the show, taking that next step, being able to take that next step. A part of that is being able to get pressure on these really good quarterbacks and affecting them in multiple different ways. So uh, I do think, you know, edge is, is definitely, you know, before, like I said, before we move on to another position, because edge isn't the only position, um, but I do think edge needs to be a top priority, if not the top priority. Yeah, and just real quick, quite frankly, I don't think Desmond Ritter gets the recognition he deserves for helping the Bucks make the postseason last oh year. Oh, my God. Dude, he, he was <laughs> terrible in that the Atlanta game in Atlanta. Oh, my God. I mean, he wasn't good. The Bucks beat themselves, the one in Tampa, too. But, it, I mean, if, if it was for him, the, the Bucs would have gotten blown out in, in Tampa if, if, if he wasn't so bad. And then, yeah, in Atlanta – Oh man, if he's like average, I don't know if the Bucks make the playoffs because they probably lose that game. It's a shame that, you know, he was so uh He's going to be missed. He's going to be missed. It, yeah, he had such a rough season as the starter for Atlanta last year that he was catching strays from Raheem Morris in the opening press conference. Like that's when you know it was generationally bad quarterback play. So, uh Desmond Ritter, we we do thank you. Yes. The, thank you for your contribution to the 2023 Buccaneers. Yeah. Um <laughs> Still better than Kyle Trask, but um, <laughs> um, so all right, let's let's move on now. I want to go uh, to the other side of the football because I do think that's the other most likely uh, scenario for round one, and that's the interior offensive line. That's there. There's mostly mostly two guys. Uh, that's uh, Oregon center Jackson Powers Johnson, who you're going to hear a lot about. I think I do think the Buccaneers like him. Um, we'll see if he's there and, and Duke. I'll say offensive lineman Graham Barton because he's playing tackle, but he really projects as a guard in the NFL. Can also play a little bit of center. I mean, this guy can play probably at all five positions. Jackson Powers Johnson is more of a prototypical center. Uh, but obviously, you know, look, the, the Bucks. Ryan Jensen is officially gone. Um, you know, he is not, he is retired. You know, he is officially out. So the Bucks, you know, whether they feel comfortable with Robert Hainsey, who knows, right? I mean, to me, I don't think Hainsey showed you enough. And I think if they get the opportunity to draft a guy like Jackson Powers Johnson, who could immediately, day one, we're talking about getting contributors, day one, he's your starting center. Like, he will be your starting center. Um, and the the interesting thing about him is I actually, it's more the days go on, I think there's more of a chance that realistically that he is available at 26 because 
it just seems like his stock has sort of been lowered a little bit. And a guy like Graham Barton, it actually seems like is less likely to be available at 26. His stock is going up. So uh, those two guys I would look at along the interior. Like I said, Graham Barton can play just about anywhere. We would guess he probably is more likely a guard in the NFL, um, but he'd be a pretty darn good option there for the Bucks too. So I think when you're looking at it, I think the trenches in round one would be the way to go. I do want to discuss a few other options that I just want to throw out there, but uh, those two guys, I think when you're discussing trenches, um, you know, definitely make a lot of sense. Yeah, I like the move at center because it just it solves those problems day one. If you get a Jackson Powers Johnson in there and he comes in and like you said, day one, week one, he is your starter. You go into camp, you develop him as a center. It's a foregone conclusion that he's going to be your guy and then you've got a guard spot to fill. I just feel like that's a much easier solution than, you know, obviously Robert Hainsey and kind of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of offensive lineman purgatory right now. We don't entirely mm -hmm. know if he's going to be a starter next year, what kind of role he's going to have. And then you talked about the Duke offensive lineman. You know, is he better fit as a guard? Is he better fit as a tackle? Can he play a little bit of center? I'm sure he can do all three, but look at what happened with Luke Gedeke. You know, he's brought in, he's a starter at guard, and he was so bad, they switched him to tackle. I don't think the Bucks are in a situation without Tom Brady at quarterback now to wait and see what happens. Not to say that they were in a situation before to wait and see what happens, but I, I don't know why, like, the reserves on the offensive line felt a little bit different uh, in that 2022 season than they do right now. I, I think you could find a better use of, uh, for more guys fighting for that guard spot than you know trying to figure out who your center is going to be because after two straight seasons of starting it's not going to be Robert Hainsey that's 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 for damn sure so I, I think you know the beginning to solving the rest of that puzzle at the offensive line in the interior it is going to be to just lock up a center I don't care who it is but I would like to know who my starting center is going to be by the end of training camp, you know, by that first preseason game, well, I'd like to have. Well, a if, if if they select Jackson Powers Johnson, you, you'll you'll have your right. Yeah, you, you'll have your answer next Thursday. But there you go. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, uh, and the thing is, like we talked about, what they did with the pass rush, they didn't do a lot on the interior offensive line for Ainsley either. Like they brought in Ben Bradison, they brought in Sua Peta, like it, like they let Aaron Stenny walk, Nick Leverett walk, like. They didn't really do a ton. So, like, again, it's like sort of uh, like, yeah, like, okay, you got more depth at guard, but like, were you kind of just more so replacing guys, you right. know? And um, that's where, you know, I do think it's it's interesting. And I think interior offensive line is definitely going to be on the, uh, you know, definitely going to be on, on the table. Uh, Isaiah, really quick in the chat, says, which one are you taking first? Jackson Powers Johnson or Graham Barton, if both are available. I want to start by saying I don't think both will be available, but if they would, I would still take Jackson Powers Johnson. I, I just think he's has the higher ceiling. I think he has the potential to be one of the top centers in the NFL, you know, in two or three years time. Uh, Graham Barton, I think is the potential to be a good player. I, I just, I put a value on getting a potential blue chip, uh, you know, player. And the only reason I think he'd be available, Jackson Power Johnson would be available you know, at 26 would be, uh, there is some slight injury concerns with him, but also like just it's a center, you know, like that, that positional value just isn't the same. Uh, and of course our, our good buddy, Willie B in the chat says center Cedric Van Pran Granger is a viable option for rounds two. Uh, he's the center from Georgia. So yeah, he makes a lot of sense. There's a couple guys, you know, there, there's a lot of interior offensive linemen here. And I'd be surprised just like I said about an edge rusher. I'd be surprised that the Buccaneers aren't walking out of this draft in the first three rounds here with at least an, an edge rusher and an interior offensive lineman, no matter where that is. I think two of their four picks are going to be at least that. Yeah, I think you have to. And you also talked about that blue chip mentality. Jason Light spoke to the media not that long ago about the type of player that they look for to be a Tampa Bay Buccaneer. And that's one of the things that he said uh, he feels like he's gotten much better at doing since becoming GM of the Bucs back in 2014. Between his first draft and now, he feels like he's got a much better idea of the character of player that he wants to come into one buck place and be a part of this organization. So I, I do think that on top of having, you know, a certain character to bring to the table, there's that certain blue chip uh, glass eater mentality we've heard to it referred to as before. And I, I think Jackson powers Johnson, I I'm excited about what he brings to the table. I just think that 
you know, of those interior offensive lineman prospects, he's the guy that identifies the most to me as what would be a Jason Light guy. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely uh, de- there's actually a lot of them in this trap. So yeah. <laughs> I'm interested, especially along the interior of the line. I'm interested to see uh, how they approach that. But I do want to before we head out, which I also I want to end it with a hypothetical question. But before that, I got to mention some other people. Um, cornerback is an option. I'm not going to say it's not. I don't think it's as likely as edge or interior offensive lineman, but it's an option. Cooley McKintree is a big name that I know a lot of people have looked at. It's possible he's available at 26. Uh, you see guys like Nate Wiggins from Clemson. I don't know if he's going to be there. Terion Arnold from Alabama, I don't think is going to be there. And then the real wild card here, um, probably a guy like Cooper DeGene from Iowa, who is kind of a Swiss Army knife back there in the secondary. Like he p- can play corner. Play safety like there. I I think it's all going to depend on preference of team. Like like what does that you know team prefer? Like where does that team see him? I think that's going to affect his value as well because if they see him as a corner, I think his value rises. If they see him as a safety, I think his value drops a little bit. So I think he could be a wild card for the Buccaneers there at twenty six, and it'd be a, it'd be an interesting option. Um, I wouldn't completely rule out secondary. I know there's been some people talking about like oh wide receiver or I. I can't really see it. Um, and yeah, and also like interior defensive linemen. We talked about edge, um, interior defensive linemen. There's just like, yeah, they just brought back Will Golston. I do think they might add an interior defensive lineman at some point. I just don't know if it's in round one. Like I said, unless somebody's there who they don't expect to be there and and, and they pick them, like that's completely possible. I mean, you know, you, ne- you never know. Uh, in 2017, you know, the Bucs weren't expecting O.G. Howard to be available when he was, right? They weren't really thinking they were going to pick a tight end in round one, but he fell, and, and that's what happened. So um, you never know, but I, I wouldn't bet that they take an interior defensive lineman. But And as linebacker, I know some people are going to ask about that. Just not a great linebacker class. Uh, just not something you want to draft in round one. So, um, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. As far as round one options go, uh, that's pretty much that. Are there any guys that you would say – are on your wish list who you definitely wouldn't expect to be there. But if they end up there, it's one of those picks that like you, you waste no time. You take this guy, no matter what, I'm sure there's a couple of names, obviously, but are there any realistic options you've thought about for the bucks? Any particular position groups like wide receiver? Is there absolutely no wide receiver prospects that would really wow the bucks at 26? Uh, Realistically, like, because obviously Marv isn't going to be there. Um, Malik and Neighbors isn't going to be there. And Rome isn't going to be there. So other than that, like Brian Thomas Jr. Maybe like, Hey, but like other than that, I don't just know. A, man. Just a gate, just a Gators fan. Not biased at all. Is Ricky Pierce all a first round guy? <laughs> he could be. I, I really I, good I, pro I, day. I, really good combine. <laughs> I'd say, I mean, another, another, another guy who could be a, a you know, a similar Role Lad McConkley or whatever from Georgia, yeah, pretty good player. Um, but yeah, I mean, I hey. probably both of them are probably second, you know, day two guys, but um, may, maybe the Buccaneers could pick one on day two. Who hey. knows? <laughs> I, I know we're gonna get into your hypothetical and we're gonna wrap this thing up, but another hypothetical I just want to pick your brain on what do you what do you think of these uh, these theories that have started to surface ever since Baker Mayfield posted a workout photo with one Scotty Miller? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's while we're it's, while we're on the topic of small white receivers. Yeah, Jordan Whitehead returned, and now it's it's Scooter's time. So yeah, that's it's gonna happen. I mean, at this point, you know, a lot of teams are, are gonna take the stance of free agency. I'm not saying that the Buccaneers are gonna actually sign him. It could just be that they are legit, maybe just friends. It's possible, right? Um, you know, I, a lot of these teams, I think, at this point, are gonna be like, all right, let's see how the draft plays out. And then I think, you know, sometime in May, you might see a little bit of a flurry, you know, with with, with teams making some moves in free agency. Um, because you know, now they know exactly where they stand, right? They're not really focused on the draft anymore. The draft is, you know, in the rear view mirror, and now they know exactly what they have, what they need. So I could see a little bit of a flurry there in free agency. So um we will we will see uh 
the return uh, of Scotty Miller. Um, not counting on it, but uh, you never know. He's you know he he's a legend in in Tampa, man. I mean that that play in the NFC Championship game is. Uh, you know, like you want to talk about iconic plays, like sure you can mention the Super Bowl, but man, that that's right up there. I mean, that's, that that is yeah. without that play, I don't know if they win that game. That was such a giant, giant momentum shift. Yeah. And I mean, I know the Bucks were up at that point anyway, but like just like the the shock value of it, the like I just think that just stunned the the the, yeah. the Packers. Yeah. And I just there was no coming back. Once that happened, I was like, all right, like they're gonna win. Yeah, like, hearing there was the no players, doubt. hearing the players talk about it, most of the locker room headed into the headed into the uh, most of the team headed into the locker room at halftime already believing they're gonna win in the NFC Championship game. That was one of those moves that. Again, just immortalize that entire game, but that moment in particular. You think back to that playoff run. I think about the Scotty Miller touchdown. I think about the Devin White interception against the uh, against the Saints. You know, to kind of steal the deal on that one in the second half of that game, and then obviously all the plays in the Super Bowl. But I I, I don't hate it. Uh, we didn't have a lot of great things to say about Scotty Miller when he was making his way out of Tampa Bay, but we also didn't think Russell Gage was going to last a collective two drives either. So. It is what it is. I'm open to a reunion. My arms are wide open for uh, Scooter to come back home. What do you got to wrap us up here, Evan? Okay, so this and I, this is going to, I think, spark some debate because I do think there's going to be people on both sides. I, I, I really do. A question for you and a question for the chat: Would you trade? Chris Godwin to the New England Patriots for the 34th overall pick. Assuming the Patriots are picking what Jay, you know, uh, Jaden Daniels or or, or or Drake May, right, in the first round, they didn't get their wide receiver. They need their wide receiver for the young quarterback. The 34th overall pick is the second pick in the second round. Would you trade Chris Godwin to the New England Patriots for the 34th overall pick. No. I, you know, it, it, you instantly you'd be like, oh, no, like, I think it's instantly, close. Like, he has a year left. Like, I don't think it's a slam dunk. No, I, it, well, and that's what I was going to get to, is that instantly you're like, oh, no. But let's be, let's be honest. You know, big Chris Godwin fans here on the show, I don't, I think his days in Tampa are numbered simply because of the contract, simply because of Mike Evans finally getting, you know, that big contract. It's tough to field a room of wide receivers on a team like this with payroll set up the way that it is, it's hard to be paying two wide receivers north of $20 million. And that's what you're doing. I think Godwin is due what? 23 million this year. Yeah. And, and, and you know, the number could rise based on the year that he has in the cap rising again. So I, I think if it gets them out of that contract and if you go into this, with a wide receiver that you really like in the first or second round, that's the only thing that would kind of confirm. Yeah, it. like you I, have to, I, I, I think you, you have you, to walk you're, you're away. Trading, with his, you're yeah. trading Godwin, and you're picking a receiver at 34. Yeah, or you've already picked a receiver at 26, and then and then you're 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 doing that. Exactly. I, you, I don't know if the Patriots would do it. And by the way, I I don't think the Buccaneers are playing this. I don't. I haven't heard anything about this. This is just a completely hypothetical thing. Um, but I do think it's worth a discussion. Yeah, I do think it is definitely worth a discussion. I, I Again, we, we always bring up Pewter Report, but there was an article they had floated out there a couple of weeks ago begging the question, could the Bucks trade Chris Godwin? Because more than one NFL analyst has said he could potentially be a trade target for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers because of that contract. Now, is it likely that it happens? No. Uh, the Bucks love Chris Godwin. No, I'm yeah. sure that they would love to have him here for at least one more season, whether they are able to figure out that salary or not. But I do think uh, when you when you talk about strictly value, you talk about delaying the inevitable here. I, I think it would allow the Bucks just a lot more breathing room, not only to come away with a replacement at potential wide receiver two right. or three, a, 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 a young but, a, cheap, a guy on a cheap yeah. four year contract, like, and then you yeah. just you free up all of that money for next year. So I I'm hesitant to say yes, but but I will say yes. I, I take that trade. As much as yeah. I love Chris Godwin, as much as I would hate to see him go, it feels inevitable because of the Mike Evans contract. Yeah, I, I, I did. I, 
I also thought that, you know, when, when Mike Evans signed that deal, I was like, okay, like not, it's not impossible because they, they have been doing it for a while, but I'm like, I don't know if they're going to elect to, you know, well, pay Mike Evans and then pay. They paid Mike Evans a second time. Are they going to elect to pay Chris Gowan on the second time? I, well, I don't and then, know. And then let's look at the situation. You know, the Bucks are going to be in next season. You look at all of the different places they're going to be throwing their money around the quarterback position, the mm-hmm. offensive tackle position, the mm-hmm. safety position and the wide receiver position. I am not a, I'm not a betting man any more than I used to be. Uh, I, I I have a gut feeling that for free agency next year, we're going to talk about the Bucks potentially wanting to get some help on the defensive side of the ball. In particular, I have a feeling next year is maybe going to be the year that sets up the Bucks to spend a little extra money on a free agent pass rusher. Now, this is a year from now. This is totally hypothetical. I could be way off of the mark, but that's what my gut tells me. And that kind of, I guess, just factors into everything. <laughs> like, I, I think the Bucks are going to be in a situation where you're going to you're going to have tough decisions to make with Chris Godwin hitting free agency. I just don't think you're going to be able to pay him and then fork over the money to go beef up another position when you're already paying Tristan Wirfs as the highest paid tackle in the yeah. NFL and Antoine Winfield is the highest paid safety. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I said, I, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I, I just, it's something that's been on my mind. I was like, I think I would do that. And like, I said, I don't know if new England would do it. Probably not. But I think if I was Jason light, I would call him and I would offer it. So, because I, I think it would be, um, I, I think it would be, uh, you know, beneficial to, to the Buccaneers. Like I said, it's not that Godwin's not a great player. He is, but we talk about, yeah, the, the future and just building this thing up. Could make sense. So, uh, really quick, you did mention Antoine Winfield Jr. Just, I wasn't even going to mention this because it's really nothing. But Adam Schefter again did say that there's, you know, more progress being made on a long term deal for Antoine Winfield. At this point, I would, I would be, and this isn't Schefter saying this is me, but at this point, I would be surprised if it, by that, I think the deadline is July fifteenth. Yeah, I think um, you're right. for for a franchise tag to you know get a deal done. Um, at, at this point, I would be shocked if they didn't get a deal done by July 15th. So uh, yeah. I, I don't know if Tristan Wirfs is going to get his deal done. I mean, I don't think you have to worry about that. I just don't know if that's going to happen before the season. But Antoine Winfield, it, it sure seems like that thing's going to get done. And I, I think it's I think it's going to get done probably before July 15th. Yeah. I, I think we're going to see that. But, you know, before, you know, maybe even before June, maybe in the month of May, who knows? Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked. Uh, Jason Light even stood on business last week, and he said that he has a pretty good track record. When he says, I'm confident a deal will get done, a deal usually gets done. So he feels just as good as anyone else uh, that a long-term extension is going to be made possible here with Antoine Winfield Jr. at the safety position. Tristan Wirfs, the verdict is still there, or the jury's still (laughs) out on on what that long-term extension could potentially look like if it does indeed happen this year. It could Mm not. You know, there's still a chance that it... It doesn't happen. Like, let's not forget that he's not a free agent until next year. So we're good. The Bucks will be picking up his fifth year option unless they pay him a long term extension. Uh, so some hiccups, some things to be figured out. But between Tristan Wirfs and Antoine Winfield Jr., almost 100 percent certain one of those two guys is going to come out of this offseason with a deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and uh brutal as bucks in the chat says just because baker doesn't use godwin doesn't mean godwin isn't legit we're not saying that i i i I did not say that godwin is a good player but that that's that wasn't really the point of the trade it wasn't like oh the bucks don't use him so get rid of him it's it's a financial thing it's a just a team building thing it's you know you sort of you got some great years out of godwin you get an asset and you move on. You bring in the next group, you know? Um, that's just sort of how these things go. Like, if you have a chance to add a young, cheap receiver, you know, who, okay, won't be what Godwin is now, won't be what Godwin is now in 2024, but what about 2025 and 2026? Like, we don't even know if Chris Godwin's going to be on this football team in 2025. So I, I think... You know, if you were presented with that trade, I think you'd have to strongly consider it. I'm not saying it's because Chris Godwin is bad. It's nothing to do with Chris Godwin's talent. It's just the financial and more of a team building thing. And and look, like that 
34th overall that's a legit asset there yeah. like, like that yeah. is day, that, like like i said i'm not even sure new england would do it <laughs> like, yeah day two pick especially 34 in my opinion as a bucks fan seems a little rich for chris godwin it does yeah it does but it, it's good value for the bucks and again from a team building perspective here's another thing too all things considered i am surprised this is not an issue the bucks have had sooner because the 2024 season will be the eighth season that Mike Evans and Chris Godwin have played together for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which is insane because the first couple of years that we had these guys, you know, when when Chris Godwin really started to break out around 2018, 2019, yeah. I'm like, there's no way we're going to be able to keep both of these right, guys in right. this wide I, I thought room. Godwin was going to be the goner. I was like, Evans is going to be here. And like, they're not, not going to – like, Godwin will have his fun here, you know, for a few years while he's on his rookie deal, yeah. and then that'll be it. But they've managed to keep them both. They've managed to make it work. It's been a fun wide receiver room to watch, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see how things shake out. Moving Chris Godwin, not 100% out of the question. Is it likely? Probably not. But – you do have to beg the question of what kind of situation the Bucks are going to find themselves in a year from now financially, and uh, that could make it a more necessary move. But Evan, any more thoughts here before we wrap this thing up? No, not much. Uh, this isn't our last show before the draft. Uh, I also have some videos. I've been doing uh, profiles uh, for d the draft prospects on, on Bucks Nation. So we'll have some videos over this week and then leading up to the draft next week uh, on some guys that, that I've profiled. Um, and we'll also have, you know, at least, at, at least, uh, definitely at least one show, probably two shows uh, b before the, the big day. Um, you know, before the big day next Thursday, like I said, it's creeping up and, uh, you know, fun times are here. I don't want to put you on the spot, but the big day is next Thursday. As you mentioned, round one of the 24 NFL draft. Are we doing anything live or are we just hanging out watching the draft? Uh, I'm just hanging out watching the draft is I, we usually have people over. So oh, uh, unless you want a bunch of people guy. in the background, uh, not, not really. Well, you know, yeah, whenever I'm, you know, I have all the hats there sitting and just waiting, which one I'm going to put on, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, Buffalo Wild Wings sponsors it. It's, you know, it's, it's really, it's really a, a good time, but, um, yeah, I mean, they, maybe, maybe Rhett, maybe you'll be, I don't want to put, now I'm putting you on the spot We're we're, we're, yeah. we're going, we're going back. Uh, you know, maybe can of our podcast will be live. I mean, I know, uh, I know the, the machine, uh, Mr. Bucks nation will, will be live streaming for seven hours or whatever he does, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I know he'll be live, but maybe, uh, maybe we'll see uh, CFP live. Oh, did you call him the machine? Yeah. <laughs> that's a new one. We've had a lot of nicknames for James over the year, but that's the first time I've heard the machine. Well, yeah, well, I can't really, you know, PG show, so I can't really say, you know. A oh, lot. Yeah, okay. Well, that's just about going to do it. Uh, should be some live content between now and, of course, the start of the 2024 NFL Draft. But that's going to do it for today's episode. Find the show on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All of those are Cannon Fire Podcasts. Best place to go for updates on the show. And, of course, Tampa Bay Buccaneer News as it happens. Speaking of Bucks News as it happens, you can follow my co-host Evan on Instagram at Bucks underscore daily. You can also find him on Twitter at Evan NFL. And check out his written work at BucksNation.com. I know you said you got some draft profiles coming out. Anything mm -hmm. else at all here over the next couple of weeks? I am actually covering the uh, – for the for the website, I'm doing the – I think it'll be out – should be out Wednesday. It's either Wednesday or Thursday morning, uh, the full uh, first-round mock. That's for everybody. So I will be doing that. Uh, for Bucks Nation, so stay tuned. Next, like I said, I don't know the exact day. It's either going to be Wednesday night, it'll be published, or Thursday morning. I'm not sure, but uh, stay tuned for that. I will have a first round mock draft, not just for the Buccaneers. I'm going to be doing it for the entire first round. So I'm um, really excited that I get the opportunity to do that this year. Looking forward to it. Should be a good one. Last but not least, you can find myself, Instagram, and Twitter at Redicus, R H E T T A K U S. If you follow me, I will follow you back, but that's the show. We will talk to you guys soon with some more coverage of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the 2024 NFL Draft. I'm your host, Rhett Matthews, signing off for my co-host, Evan Wanish. We'll talk to you in the next one. Until then, and as always, thank you for listening, and go Bucks.